We haven't got a gavel tonight, so I'll just knock on the table. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. Well, especially welcome the people who are here in Neville Hall with us tonight. And uh, let's not forget the people on Zoom and on YouTube. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, just a few little messages, first of all. Uh, we've got to be careful. Uh, in the event of any catastrophes, like a fire starting, we do make a, a, you know, a, a, an even exit via where the signs are and uh, meet up outside. I don't think it's going to happen tonight, but who knows. Uh, the other thing is, uh, could you switch your telephones off, please? Um, certainly for members of the North England Institute, there's a £20 fine if your telephone goes off. It hasn't happened yet, except to, uh, to our last president, but uh, <laughs> he didn't pay. Um, simple little things like that. Um, could you please ensure you have signed the register because a small amount of money comes our way for uh, the names that are on there. Um, looking forward to that. Um, and, well, other than that, um, let's, uh, have we any uh, apologies for absence tonight? Andrew, have you any apologies? No. No. Oh, good. Well, that's okay. I've, I've got David Douglas, uh, Rick Smith, and uh, Malcolm Tilly. Brian Pickering, uh, make a note of that, would you, Andrew? Good. <laughs> uh, Andrew, would you like to go ahead and uh, go through the minutes of the last meeting? Yes, delighted, Steve. Um, so our last lecture was in March, and it was given by Professor Jeroen van Hoenen of Durham University on uh, modelling heat extraction from old mine workings. I think it generated a lot of interest in the room and a lot of excellent questions. And there was a superb vote of thanks given by our very own Derek Newton uh, with closing remarks for yourself. So I think we can take that as a true record of the last meeting, Steve. Yes, we can indeed. Just a few additional notices. Uh, our, we're coming to the end of our lecture series uh, for this, this session, but don't worry, we're working on a range of exciting new titles uh, for 22 to 23 uh, session. Uh, but just to conclude, our next lecture is on the 19th of May. It's on the terahertz region. Uh, so it's an electrical engineering talk given by Professor Andrew Gallant from the University of Durham. Uh, terahertz it lies between the infrared and the microwave spectrum, and there's a lot of interesting applications which are starting to come out of it. So uh, hopefully see you all there for that. Uh, and of course, our final lecture of the year uh, is jointly with a number of other organizations on a nautical theme on uh, operational efficiency and sustainability in ship design given by Keith Hutchinson or Sarafina group. Uh, Keith is certainly incredibly enthusiastic to be giving this talk so hopefully we'll have an excellent uh, attendance for that one as well. Don't forget, uh, I'm sure a number of you are following us online already. Uh, we're, we're going up every single month, which is fantastic. Uh, but if you want any further information on any of our, our events, do just go to mininginstitute.org.uk or check out any of our socials channels. Uh, we've got a wide range of events and activities you can join in with uh, from excellent events like this one. We've got hopefully about two conferences at the moment planned for next year. Uh, we recently held our annual dinner for a wide range of uh, professional men and women from across the northeast and further afield uh, and we'd like to thank the county hotel for all of their their hard work there and we'll be having a further dinner in the autumn in Neville Hall. Uh, we're increasingly opening up our social calendar and of course thanks to Dr Neil Davis of Cambridge University for leading our most recent field trip on the hunt for giant millipedes in Northumberland as well. And we, we all had an excellent day despite, despite it snowing at one point. So it, uh, what a wonderful day out to the beach. Uh, so we've got a lot on. And of course, the best way to find out more about our events uh, and to get involved is of course, the support us through membership. So plenty of excellent things on offer. Just go to mininstitute.org.uk forward slash membership for more information. Uh, and that's all the notices, Steve. I'll hand back to you uh, for what looks to be a very popular Popular lecture. I think we're, we're, we're pretty much packed out, aren't we, in the room? We are. Yes, I very much agree with you there. And uh, <clears throat> we'll, le we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That's wonderful. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Coverdale, um, Geotechnical Design Lead uh, to the Costa and Jacobs Partnership. And she's going to tell us tonight about the treatment of mine workings on A1 Scotswood North Brunton and the A1 Birdley to Cole House. Uh, Sarah is the geotechnical uh, design lead for the Custain Jacobs Partnership uh, on the above mentioned uh, talk. Um, 
and she's had over 20 years experience in the industry and she's uh, got a lot of experience in the stabilization of abandoned mine workings and uh, throughout her career in the northeast and north of England and Scotland and she's also involved in the upcoming A1 Morpeth to Allingham project uh, which is due to commence mid this year. Uh, just a little thing about uh, about the, the talk itself, it'll only take two seconds. Uh, this talk's going to cover the geological structure beneath both sites and uh, the extent of historical mine workings along with the risks this posed to the permanent design. It'll also go on to explain the challenges of treating these mine workings on a live network and associated risks involved. So you don't want to hear my voice anymore, uh, and that I'm going to pass across to Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Thank you. Well, this technology is a bit much for me. Um, can I also introduce David Lynn here, who's the construction manager? Uh, I'll talk through the sites, the geological setting for both of those sites, and then we'll just we'll leave these projects for a little while, and I'll go through the mining methods that happened historically, uh, the type of collapses um, that you get associated with those mining methods. Um, I'll talk through what mining records there are and how much we believe them, and then how we go on to assess the risk from shallow mining to a site. Uh, I will then pass back to Dave, who will talk us through the constraints of uh, working on a live network, because this was all done um, without shutting the road full time. Um, and then I'll, just, we'll sh I'll show you some pictures of how it was actually treated. So. I'll just pass you over to Dave. I don't mean that, I'm worried. <laughs> okay, uh, as Sarah says, I'm David Lynn, uh, construction manager for C CJP on the A1 Scotswood North Brunton project. Um, my colleague Sarah uh, Boyne is construction manager of Berkeley. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. Uh, so just a brief one about the schemes. These two schemes are uh, part of three that Costi and Jacobs Partnership have on the uh, A1 in the North East as part of the RDP framework. Um, A1 Scotswood North Brunton stretching from the River Tyne up to Gosforth Park at Junction 79. Uh, Burley to Coal House from Junction 70, uh, 65 sorry, to 67, uh, just passing the Angel of the North. Um, we're adding additional lanes on, on both projects. Scotswood adding additional lane, the full length of the job from Junction 74 to 79. Uh, and on Burley adding a, a third lane on the northbound carriageway and a fourth lane on the southbound carriageway. next one's yours as well. No sitting down. <laughs> so yeah, um, so like I said, Scott took North Brunton's mind, so I know a lot more about the scheme. So um, the work's involved. We are installing a new concrete safety barrier down the central reserve. Uh, that phase is finished for you, those of you who live local and have seen the works. Um, part of that uh, work, we had to drill and grout a lot of mine workings, which Sarah will go into a lot more detail later, in the central reserve. Um, we did central reserve phase first so we could move all the traffic into the centre whilst we got into the verges uh, and widened the verges, uh, um, updating all the drainage network in there, uh, again drilling and grouting mine workings in the verges as well uh, to, to um, strengthen the, the verge for that, that additional lane on, on either side. Thank you. Right. This is yours. Yes, you can escape now. So. I hope you can all see that. Um, that is a long section along the A1 from the River Tyne on the left to roughly where the Ooseburn is on, um, on the right. And that shows, that is um, slightly exaggerated vertical scale. But um, what you can see there is lots of coal seams uh, the primary one of concern is the high main, uh, which you can see is present through two-thirds of the site. That is the biggest seam in the region, for anybody who doesn't know, um, up to three metres thick, up to about 2 to 2.5 on this site, and it is there as one coal seam. Some places in the northeast, it's actually two, the top and the bottom high main, but here it's just one seam together. 
uh, you can see there is a very slight um, anticline to the structure, although it is very disrupted by faulting. So the high main actually, from the north, it actually, as you're heading south, it actually rises steeper than the road does. And at junction 77, which I'll just flick back, so you can see where junction 77 is, the Usburn, where the section starts, is um, just past junction 78. And then um, between junction 77 and 76 is the highest point of the scheme. And the high main actually rises up, and it would have been much higher than the road that's at its current level. Because during the original construction, some of you might remember, this was all excavated, and it was effectively an open cast. Um, so they didn't just excavate the cutting, they actually excavated the shallow coal that would have been under the road footprint, and that affected two junctions. There's actually been some quite deep excavations underneath the road, and then beyond that, where it's still a risk, there's been mine treatment done already. Um, there was some done during construction. They did treat mine workings beneath junction 77 and 76, they didn't treat anything at Junction 75, which is just a bit further south, but I'll go on to that shortly. Um, and then the sections in between, um, generally, there was no historical treatment done, but it is generally a lower risk. But we are now looking at this later. The mine workings have had longer to do whatever they're going to do. And... Um, we are, we are now considering risk in the way that we would now. This was, that was done in the late 80s. So there's a bit, we're a little bit more risk averse now. Um, so we have treated some beyond the treatment that was already done. Just in case anyone was wondering why this wasn't treated originally. Um, if you look at the left of the screen, you can see there's two red diagonal lines, which is the vicinity of the 90 fathom fault, which is a very significant fault that you'd know in the region. 90 fathoms, what's 90 fathoms? <laughs> Thank you. So, that, that is interesting because you can see on there you have the Riot 5 quarter running right up to the 90 fathom fault and the other side you've got the Durham Low Main. The Durham Low Main is much, much older than the Riot 5 quarter with a I would say a distance between them of about 80 metres. How's that in feet? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, it must be more than that then. Yeah. So there's a massive displacement on there. Um, so the 90 fathom fault, it isn't just a single fault, it's quite a big shatter zone. And um, junction 75, that actually wasn't treated during the original construction the coal actually gets deeper as it goes underneath the junction. It, um, and then it comes back up again near to the fault. So we actually have treated some to the south of junction 75 and a little bit to the north, but actually under the junction, it was fine, which is very handy for when they originally built it. Um, right. Now, I'm just going to hand back to Dave to talk a little bit about Berkeley. Just very briefly, yes, not my, not my project this one, but yeah. Um, so Berkeley, um, mentioned before, we're uh, increasing capacity, adding an additional, additional lane on the northbound carriageway, so that's going up the three lanes, and on the southbound, uh, four lanes from 65 at Coal House up to Junction 67 at Berkeley. Um, the photograph uh, here is uh, down at Coal House, so that bridge in the background is Aladdin Bridge, um, the main bridge crossing the East Coast Main Line. Um, it, it's falling down, bad state of repair. As part of this project, we are uh, constructing a new bridge um, to the right-hand side, so kind of in the direction where that photograph is pointing. Yeah, you know, so the, new, the new bridge is going there. It is, and yeah. uh, demolishing the, uh, the existing bridge over a, a Christmas shutdown. Um, I can't remember if it's done this year or next year, to be honest. But, yeah, Christmas know. Day shutdown to demolish the existing bridge. Um, so a lot of uh, mine work treatments going on in... in that space you see in the photograph there, a lot of piling, um, kicking off those, again, who pass the area will see just how much space uh, the Berkeley team have taken up in that 
in that area, the size of the compound, the amount of rigs there. Um, speaking to the project lead, Russ Furnival, a few weeks ago, I think they're totaling out at 17 rigs. I think they peak at 17 rigs. So if it doesn't look busy now, it, it's going to look a lot more busy in, in the coming months. Um, so yeah, a lot of work going on down there at the moment. Um, so I'm actually only going to talk about this part of the Berkeley scheme. Um, the Berkeley scheme is very long, but um, I'm actually only going to focus on Aladdin because that's, to me, that's the interesting bit. The rest of it, it's just the high main, like at Scotswood. So um, here, let me just go on to a very busy, very, very busy cross section. The area of Team Valley is a massive glacial channel. Um, if you can see the levels there, we're starting at about 20 to 25 meters AOD. Um, the bottom of the glacial valley is actually down around minus 55 at worst, which is extremely deep. You can see, I'm struggling with the pointer. Oh, there's the cursor, right? You can see that the base of the valley is there, running along there, which is unbelievably deep. But then at both sides, the rock up there, up, up, <laughs> the rock comes right back up again. Um, so, and this is the region here of Aladdin Railway Bridge. I don't know if you can actually see, but there's a, there's a green line there, which is actually the natural ground profile where the East Coast Main Line is. And then the line above it is the new road profile. So in this area here, we are piling for the new bridge. And normally when you treat mine workings, 30 metres maybe about the maximum depth you ever go. Very rarely go any deeper. But our piles are down here. They're ending up right down here in among these coal seams here. So we are treating mine workings up to around 60 metres deep. Um, and this is very unusual and very, very challenging, as some of the audience would attest to. Um, so um, extremely difficult. So what, what you've actually got there is that some of the seams that we had at Scotswood, which is the um, Durham Low Main, the Brassville and the Hutton, are... Um, very close to bedrock, very close to rockhead underneath where these piles are. The outer few metres of the rock at the base of this glacial valley is extremely shattered. And quite often the shallowest seam that we're expecting there hasn't really been found, or if it has, it's, it hasn't been worked, it's just mashed, to be honest. Um, the, the valley is mostly filled with laminated clay, there's a bit of glacial till uh, sort of boulder clay, you might call it, towards the base, and there is some sand towards the base as well. Uh, extremely challenging conditions there. Um, I'll move on. We might come back to this later on. Uh, just the rest of the Berkeley scheme, the bedrock is within four to five metres of the road, and treatment isn't going beyond about 30, 35 metres. So this is the particularly unusual part. Ah, right. So I've moved away from Scotswood. This is not a hole on Scotswood or Berkeley, so nobody worry about it. Um, just to show you what underground mine workings look like, um, I'm quite a privileged position that I've worked in open cast mining historically. So I've been in there, I've walked in among the pillars once they've been cleaned out. Um, so this is some pictures from that. So um, there's different types of mining. The most common one for shallow, shallow mining that's been done historically is pillar and stall. Sometimes it's called room and stoop. It's more common in Scotland. And um, that's where they leave pillars of coal. As you can see, these solid bits of coal are the pillars. And then the voids are where the miners work. Um, no, it's really not playing ball, is it? Sorry. No, sorry. Um, so... So the picture to the um, top left, that is effectively the scene that you can see below, but before 
a very clever machine driver had excavated the backfill or collapsed rock that had fallen into those voids. Because um, when during an open cast, even if some of those voids had been, even if it had been left intact, once they start digging above, it all just falls into the hole. Um, and so they have to, before they extract coal, they will dig out the waste that's in the, um, in the voids and um, just then take the coal. So this is the kind of layout of voids that we're looking to try and infill when we're treating mine workings. Um, other methods that of mining that you come across are bell pits, which happen very, when you've got very shallow rock and very shallow, big coal seams, you tend to get bell pits, which are just a small hole that one man has dug, gone down and mined around the base of that hole until it started to collapse. Was that you? <laughs> um, then we have pillar and stall, which is the most common. There's long wall mining, which is the more modern method of mining, but that's always much deeper. Um, so we don't need to worry about that for current development, really. And there is, of course, open cast, which this was. Uh, right. So this time I'll talk about the different types of collapse that we get. Um, there's two main types of collapse that you get with the um, shallow mine workings with the pillar and stall. And that is either a block failure or conical collapse. Now, um, the block failure tends to happen, well, it can happen at any time, but it's, it's the type of collapse that can occur when there's changes of load above mine workings, and um, when load actually transmits to the top of the void and it just simply breaks and falls down. And then that will start to migrate upwards. The conical collapse can happen at any time once the mine has been opened, and that is where the, the roof of the void actually falls in, and then that void con starts to migrate upwards. I've got some little cartoon pictures there of um, a conical collapse that actually reached the surface and one that was on its way to the surface. So um, the distance that that conical collapse can happen, can, can travel, depends on the strength of the rock. Um, if you've got very strong rock above your coal seam, above your void, it, if it does break, it will leave large air gaps between it. It's the, the bulking factor that you would know from, from earthworks. Um, but if you've got weaker rock, like a weak mudstone, it breaks into very small pieces. So you don't get very many air voids. So that um, void can travel a long way before it effectively blocks itself. Um, so if we've got weaker rocks, we find this area to be much higher risk than if we've got much stronger rocks. Um, the other type of collapse, that, well, subsidence that you can get is if you have voids which reach the superficial deposits and then they can start to fan out and you'll get a wider settlement bowl if you've got softened materials that will sort of squidge into the hole. Um, it also happens if you have sand, it, it just flows in, so you get like a big bowl, but often that won't result in a very big... Uh, depression at the surface. Now, there are records of historical mine workings. These are just some abandonment plans from, from the local area. They're all from Newcastle. They are not true. They're, they're quite true. They're just not really true. So what they tell you is which areas have been mined and they tell you broadly how it was mined. And they usually tell you where there was mine entries. But if you managed by some magic to be able to position one of these plans onto a current map and get some very accurate, co accurate coordinates, and you drilled hoping to find the little roadway or the little coal pillar there, um, you'd be very lucky to hit it. Um, these plans are at random scales. 
they are in random orientations. You can usually position yourself using some surface features. You can see all of those plans actually have some surface features on them, but they're few and far between. But we do use them. They are a very useful record, but they are not gospel truth. So if, if you have a plan that says that this little small area near you, say you wanted to develop a small area, if you have a plan that says there's no mine workings in this area that's 40 by 40 metres, it's not true. I mean, the, it could be true, but it's, it's not true. Um, but they're still very, very, very useful. Um, so, <coughs> this is a very useful real-life cross-section I have, again, out of an open cast. Um, so, how we assess how far voids might travel is we look at the depth of the coal seam, the, um, the thickness of the coal seam, and then we look at the rock that's above it. We look at the type of rock, so a stronger rock, we would allow there to be less rock there before we needed to actually do any mitigation. Uh, we also have to consider the actual um, width of the void that could have been created. So generally, if you have a two metre thick void, two metre high void, the maximum width that the workings would be would be around four metres. It would be very unlikely to be any more than that. Um, and then we also consider other risks, such as changing in load conditions and changing in groundwater. It's, it's if we're in a strong rock, we might consider perhaps a 10 to 1 ratio of the difference between the void and the rock. And if there's more than that, then it's not a risk. It's not possible for a conical collapse to migrate to the surface. Um, sorry, if we're in a if we're in a strong in a weaker rock, sorry. If it's stronger, we might go down to as much as perhaps six to one. We do consider the um, the benefit from superficial deposits as well, but usually only if it's a stiff clay. If it if it's sand or if it's a softer clay, we wouldn't because they would allow this wider depression to happen. So, if we decide we're going to treat mine workings, should I just go back to that slide? So, um, just you can all see that picture and just admire this picture. So this this is um, a cross section through a glacial till sandstone, then a coal seam with the mining void, a cross section through that mining void, and then into the mudstone underneath it. So the coal seam is the greyish bit halfway down. It was actually black, but it just doesn't show in the picture. So this, um, this actually was from a goods yard, and there used to be trains running across the top of this, and there had been collapses on this site. So you can see there that you've got quite a strong sandstone that is sort of bridging over that, but eventually, with the jointing, those um, blocks would have fallen out and fallen into that void. In fact, you can actually see there has been some collapse inside. It's just my favourite picture. I have actually got one of a man stood next to it, but I thought it wouldn't be appropriate to bring the picture of the man stood with his back to that excavation. <laughs> right, so if we decide that we do need to treat mine workings, um, it's usually done by drilling and grouting, as has been done at Scotswood. Um, so we determine the area that needs to be treated we have to consider outside the actual footprint of what we're building because of the angle of draw. So something that's, depending on the depth, something that's typically four to five metres outside the area. But sometimes we might go further if it's very deep. And then we will determine the treatment grid, which is based on the um, potential void width. So that four metres from the two metre seam. Um, and then we would inject grout into these boreholes. So we drill down into the borehole, into the void or into the broken ground, and grout would be added. This would be a PFA cement mix. Sometimes there are fancier other 
um, expanding foam methods and things, but they're not practical on large sites. But I have seen it done. In fact, it was actually done on the A1 near the Metro Centre on one, one hole, one mine shaft. Uh, but it's not common. Um, so this grout can be installed either by gravity, which we have done on Scotswood, or it can be done under pressure. We, we prefer to grout under pressure, but when we are grouting underneath existing assets, we can't do that, because we have the risk of ground heave. We don't just have the structures, we've got all sorts of sensitive infrastructure. So um, both Scotswood and Berkeley have all been done gravity fed, which has caused some problems, but um, unfortunately that's the constraints that we have. Um, does anybody have any questions about that before I move on? Because I'm going to go on to the site's constraints. Okay. Right. Dave, would you like to talk about the constraints we have of trying to treat this large area that we want to stabilise with a road on top of it? Yes, I can do. You let me in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, uh, Sarah said, the um, biggest challenge for us is that we are uh, drilling and grouting through the main uh, section of A1 through Newcastle. Um, the high level requirements of, of, of the project are we maintain two lanes of traffic in either direction between hours of 6 in the morning and 8 o'clock at night. Otherwise, we would have closed the A1 for six months, gone in there and done the job in six months and got out. And big diversion for six months. Um, can't do that. So everything, um, due to the nature of the work, we, we work with uh, three drilling rigs generally on, on Scotswood. Um, we had uh, water tankers coming in every night uh, and going out every night to be refilled. We had a grouting plant set up off-site because, again, the A1 through Newcastle, very tight uh, site. And actually the highway's boundary is generally someone's back garden in quite a lot of the areas, especially where we're drilling and grouting south of 77. We have residential properties literally batting onto, onto the A1, um, which yeah, can result in quite a number of complaints when there's three drilling rigs in the central reserve every night, um, drilling down to depths of 30 metres, we mentioned earlier, that's the, the, the deepest we went on Scotswood. Um, so yeah, closure goes on, first corner at 8 o'clock, generally get access to the site at 10. Um, we're kicking the teams off the, uh, off the site at 4 o'clock in the morning because we have to get the road reopened, swept, cleaned, and, and open the traffic by six o'clock. So a six hour working window um, to get everyone to the site, uh, get the rigs fired up, drill and grout. Um, we've got some more photos. Mm -hmm. uh, in the depths of winter, snow lying on the ground. Um, been out there before with uh, the person who's in the theater hall <laughs> right now, Chris. Uh, been out there before, like that, two o'clock in the morning, wondering, or made the right life choices. Um, but yeah, a um, lot of work that went into that. Um, we, we were fortunate enough that we could leave the rigs in the central reserve because that would have been um, a bigger nightmare to try and get them off site every night. So we left the rigs in the central reserve, but grout was brought in on the back of concrete wagons, pumped out of the wagons into the hole. Um, we had restrictions on the amount of grout we were putting in each hole for, you know, for reasons of the area we were trying to treat. We didn't want we, we didn't want to grout up under anybody's house. Basically, we didn't want grout Maybe. running off site somewhere where it shouldn't, so we were restricted to the amount of grout we could treat, uh, we could put in every hole every night, so again, that impacted on programme. Um, so we, we spent the best part of last year uh, drilling and grouting in the central reserve, six different areas uh, on drill grids ranging from one and a half metres to about six metres. A few intermediate holes um, down at 75, a lot of grout taken down at 75. And then when that, when that was finished and we, and we built the central reserve, we, we, we constructed the concrete wall, we switched the traffic, we then had to do it all again in the verges as well. Um, so again, a lot of areas in the verges, um, unfortunately just didn't have the space, unable to, to drill and grout during the day. We Arctic tank that's coming in with water, uh, mixing grout in an off-site uh, off compound and bringing that to the site in the back of concrete wagons. Just physically can't fit it in on the A1 through Newcastle during the day. So again, all the verge phase was all nights as well. Um, even closer to those residential properties and even closer to the back gardens. Um, so yeah, not, a, not an easy task. Pleased to say that all drilling and grouting is finished on Scotswood. 
um, you know, we are nearing, nearing the end now. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been a challenge. Definitely, thank you. And I will draw your attention to the best thing they ever bought, which is that coffee machine, <laughs> which, which the Nightworks team really enjoyed. Um, right, so I'm just, so we've talked about these con very constrained areas that, that we're treating from, so we're either in the central reserve or effectively on the flat bits of the verges, but we needed to treat this area on a six metre grid. So, this is how it was done. Um, and it's fascinating, it's like a spider's web. So, what, I wish I could point at this. Um, so, we've got two cross sections there. This is both from Junction 77. And this is treating the high main underneath the A1. Both of these cross sections are facing north. So, you can see in the middle is the main line and then you've got the steps either side which are the slip roads and then the ground continues to go up because this is a massive cutting. So you can see that boreholes were drilled from the slip roads, from the verges both sides and in the central reserve with all these angles calculated to hit that six metre wide grid. And I have to say it was pretty close. Um, it's difficult because you never know exactly what depth the seam was at. The seam was supposed to be relatively flat. As you can see, it has a bit of a wiggle. Um, this, these cross sections actually sort of show that there was probably a fault running roughly parallel with the central reserve. Because you can see there's a bit of a, a kick in the middle of the road on both cross sections. It's more pronounced on the, um, on the first one. But these are things that you would just never know um, through ground investigation. You'll just think it was dip, but I think that is actually a fault. And then the section at the bottom is a long section down the central reserve, which shows the high main near Junction 77 on the left, and then heading north towards Junction 78, getting progressively deeper. And by the end of this long section, it was deep enough to not be a risk. And one of the first times ever the grouting works actually match the prediction, which was amazing. So the square, well, so the rectangle at the top um, is bearing in mind that's an exaggerated scale. Um, that's the section that was being treated that shows in this long section. And it beautifully goes in the direction it was supposed to, which is quite amazing. Um, we've got lots of these long sections throughout the scheme. It's actually really interesting to... You, you never really know what a coal seam does until you've grouted it, because then you've got holes every six metres or, or less, and you actually finally get a proper pattern of what it looks like. Um, but these are, these are cross-sections from our completion report that we do at the end of the job. And um, these... These ones particularly, I think, with the angle boreholes, are fascinating. Um, and that is about it. But would anybody like to ask any questions? Well, there you are. There's a lot to ask questions on there, so... Uh, let's not fight you over it. First one, put his hand up. Phil. Uh, the grounding, although I understand it's not an exact science, um, it seems to be fairly hit miss. How do you control the, the rate of the curing of the, of the medium as it flows down the hose? Um, it must be pretty... Dicey. Um, it's pretty dicey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, if, if the gravity feed seemed to me to be, you know, how, how would you get it far enough down to, to actually flow into the void before oh, it right. sets? right. Okay, so um, there's actually a pipe, a semi-rigid pipe, which is inserted down the borehole, right, right to the base of the borehole. Um, so the grout actually comes out from there, and then that pipe is slowly withdrawn. Okay. And yeah. that's, that's a fairly common yeah. practice. If, you, if you're pressure grouting, you might not do that, but if you're doing it by gravity, you would put the pipe right to the base. Right. 
um, and that ensures that you know if you know that that hole is still open, because sometimes in broken ground, um, that borehole could start to collapse. It, it sort of immediately the drill rods come out, and in that case, it could block itself up, and so the grout wouldn't go in. Mm. So that's why this pipe is inserted right to the base. Uh, David Granger, Nimi. Um, so, how did you actually find the voids? It's potluck. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you didn't actually. Well, did you drill a grid, a grid system? Yeah, yeah. So it's done on a grid system, um, a roughly square grid. Sometimes it's done on more of a diamond pattern, but it's it's a roughly square grid, mm -hmm. and. As long as you do enough holes, you've got a reasonable chance that you're going to get yeah, all the Yeah, so are you talking about yeah. 10 metres or...? So the maximum you ever do is about 6 metres spacing. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. we'd go down as much as 3. Crikey, that, that's, that's a lot of, lot of balls, lot of balls. <laughs> going yeah. down. Thank you very much. Yeah. So how do you determine when you've reached the void? Is it just feedback from the, the drilling rig itself that you, you realise so you've reached the, the void? So the, the drillers know what they're drilling through. They, they can tell you. They, they do have a flush that comes out. They usually... Um, we, it's easier if you can do it with air flush. Um, but when you've got residential development nearby, you can't really risk the addition of compressed air into the ground because you can move gas around. So they drill with water flush which means that you get this grey slop comes out. Um, so based on, based on the rate of drilling, they can determine what they're going through. If they go through a void, the rods will actually drop. Um, but also, there is some from the flush as well. Um, the flush has a bit of a delay on it. It's about, I don't know, probably a metre's delay, I suppose, on when, when it gets to the surface. But they, they do know what they're in. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Norm Jackson, Seton Sleuth. Um, your, your scheme here is effectively to widen a road that's been there for quite a number of years. The question I would like to ask you is, do you know how much that road has moved since it was constructed, which I would influence your design in what you're trying to do now? Is there any monitoring of the bridges taking place that are there? Um, what monitoring are you putting in to ensure that your work, when you complete your, your grouting, etc., makes the ground stable? Is there any of this built into your, your design? We don't monitor grouting. So the, um, we verify that it's been done effectively by doing pressure tests. So after the grouting has been completed in an area, additional holes are drilled and pressure is applied to those to see if they'll take more grout. So that's how we verify that the ground has been filled. As, as far as the existing structures go, all of those existing structures have either been determined to be not at risk by a risk assessment, or if they were, they were grouted before construction. But the question I was asking is, and I think you've answered it, is that there is no monitoring taking place of either the road profiles or the structures, no. which I find extremely disturbing and worrying really? that uh, there could be movement taking place underground when you're mining and you're supporting the roof, mm -hmm. you're monitoring to see what happens. Yeah. You're telling me on the surface we're not doing the same thing. But we have mitigated the risk by filling in the voids. And the majority of the site is not at risk because of how deep the mine workings are. You might monitor it for other, other reasons, but not for the mine workings. Stuart Thanks, Mr. President. Um, considering that you're spending our taxpayers' money, how do you manage to um, maintain your budget and how do you control your budget? <laughs> <laughs> With some very good QSs. Um, yeah, we. we um, how, how do you answer that one? Is it like yeah. an old. Uh, sort of government budget, it's endless and you just spend what it was. No, <laughs> no, um, the, the prices for the project is a fixed price. Um, um, 
a lot of the risk sits on the contract now, rather than national highways and our back pockets. Um, so a lot of this drilling and grouting, without going into too much detail, um, was a surprise to the project, shall we say. The amount of drilling and grouting was a surprise. Um, and as that went up and up, uh, our uh, profit margin went down and down. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fixed price project. Um, there, there is um, obviously risk pots associated with dealing with situations like this. Um, but yeah, other than getting into the detail, and we, we don't go cap in hand asking for more money. So there must be some variation in your budget, because if you're going to hit something with doors, like you have to have a there's, there's risk pots set up for, uh, you know, all different packages of work will have a, a budget aside for drainage, curbing, surfacing, uh, and, and drilling and grouting had an amount to it. Um, obviously, it, it's the un unknown until you start drilling, you don't know what's in the ground. Um, we have risk pots associated and uh, we draw down on that risk pot if we need to and if we don't, at the end of the job we, we give it back to the client or a percentage back to the client. It's been quite painful on Scott's but not from the Not that painful. Yeah, um, Samuel Graham, uh, Newcastle University. Um, I know from, it might have been partly answered by the gentleman's question earlier when you say in practice it's potluck when you actually drill these holes to put them in. I can... When you were talking about the mine plans before, I can feel your pain because I spent the last two di weeks digitising those and then hoping a borehole is going to go where I want it to go and <laughs> it, was, it didn't. But essentially, when, when you are looking at these plans beforehand, is there any, do you do anything to kind of quantify how close to where you think things are, are going to be? Or, or do you, so like if you think, I think the coordinate's going to be X, do you have any sort of mechanism for working out the chance that it's going to be within X? Is that done or do you not do that? Okay, so we do that for mine shafts. Okay. Um, but general workings, those room and pillars, they're, they're just an area. Sure. No, yeah. I was just thinking because the reason I was digital, I was working funny enough, on the mine water heating that the last speaker had done, and that to me strikes as something that could actually become actually an area that might be of interest to actually be able to constrain that better because if we do actually need to specifically target those holes I was, it, it, if I was wondering whether there were methodologies in the industry from the geotechnic side that might be something you could take over into, into my water. Um, I would say the only parts that you could be pretty certain on are the main roadways mm -hmm. so the, the smaller areas of workings, um, all the little rooms and pillars, they they will not be accurate, but where the main roadways are, which, can I go back? I think there's some on that. So there are some roadways on here. Um, if you look at the one to the top left, you can actually see the actual colliery is in the centre there. And you can see going to the right from there is a very long straight road. So that's an underground roadway. That will be true. Um, the, the layout probably of those ones heading off to the northeast. Sorry. Yeah, northeast. I'm not good on left and right. And east, yeah, you know what I'm like. Um, they, they may be true, but once you get the ones going the other way, no. Um, but yeah, the main roadways, are, I would say, probably a fairly good bet, but anything else, I don't think so. Hmm. Hello, uh, Chris, Chris Armstrong from Waddell Armstrong. Um, just a general project question, I think, maybe for you. Somewhat related to the previous questions over here. Um, what is the design life for the new bridge? And what is the total cost for each project for the taxpayer? Not just your own cost, but I guess National Highway's cost. I can answer the design life. Well, you, you, go for, you go first one. Probably. So yeah. the design life for all structures is 120 years. Uh, the figures quoted on National Highway's website for both projects, Scotswood, is, I think, is 109 million, and Berkeley is 213 Something million, like that. 220 yeah. million, around them figures there. Dwarfed by Morpeth, which will start later in the year at 313 million. Another one? Duncan? Duncan Summers? Duncan Summers, civil engineer. Um, I, uh, for my sins, uh, work for John Molum 
on the uh, uh, north bank into St. Desure, not far away, but far enough away, which was on White House Road, mm -hmm. going into Buddle Street, I seem yeah. to recall. Mm -hmm. Now, we put two uh, uh, tunneling machines, Keith Robinson tunneling machines by today's standards, to work a couple of door schools. Yes. Now, when we set off from the site, the site, the main site was opposite where the abattoir was, mm -hmm. which I now believe is the Enterprise yes, building. Yes, the White House Centre. Forgive was. me. Yeah. Um, and when we set off um, downstream, we used to rip through it at uh, eight, ten rings a shift, which is like sixteen feet, sixteen feet a shift. Upstream, we were lucky if we got. Uh, one, two rings, which is like two feet, something like that, 0.6 of a metre. And eventually we had to withdraw the tunnelling machine in the upstream and go drill and fire. I mean, when we went to look at the cores, it was like a stick of rock, and you'd actually had to break the core to get it in the core box for the upstream side. But on the downstream side, it was, it was soft mudstone and... Yeah, the machine ripped through it. Now, when we came further downstream towards Shand, Shand's were the next contractor to us, um, we, we ran into where there was, were coal workings and it, there, was no, there was nothing in the, um, in the contract about these coal workings, uh, but we ran into them and in the middle of the night we stopped because the, the night shift engineer phoned me up and said, I think, we'd be, I think you'd better come down in here and have a look. And when you went out through the face, you could see for 100 yards, up, right up through all the, the coal workings that there were. Um, so, I mean, it was, and there was no, nothing in the contract about what that was. <laughs> I'll not say how we overcame it. I'll leave that to, for Northumbrian Water to tell you. It's just a piece of information. Yeah, I've actually been in that tunnel. Wow. As it comes down White House Road, I've been in it. You can walk in it. Because I was involved in the redevelopment of the Scotswood site many years ago. Um, we yes, where we met, yeah. ironically. Do we have anyone else with a question? Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, is there any new technology that's either already available or sort of in development that would help you locate these mine workings and therefore sort of reduce your pot luck? Um, not that we go deep enough usually. If you've got very shallow mine workings, <coughs> there will be some geophysics, some probably surface geophysics that you could find them with, but they would have to be very shallow. Uh, there are companies now who, if you find a void, can then put um, things down the boreholes and do laser scans and things of what's down there. I've seen that done, but um, there's nothing that would map them at depths underground. I suppose that the only thing that we did at Scottswood, um, we had a um, probing exercise basically where we had one rig come in, the centuries are very early on in the project, and we uh, went probing uh, based on um, you know, historical drawings, a knowledge of the area, uh, just to try and quantify the amount of work involved so that we could report back in terms of impact on programme mm -hmm. and, and what that would do to delivery. Um, so that was the only way we could do it, was to put a rig there and drill down and report back on what they found. Yeah, because yeah. the big unknown you have is how, how big are the voids, so therefore how much grout will they take, and also were they backfilled during the original um, excavation, because that's quite common. Are we very over? Oh, we're not. We're not, okay. <laughs> and I saw you with your watch. Um, because sometimes, and it's quite common in Newcastle area, it actually is they, they would mine one of these little rooms off their roadway, and then the waste that they had from that, they would shove into one of the other ones that they'd already done. Um, so when that's happened, you've actually got, you've still got some risk of collapse because that's unconsolidated ground. But... You, you can often find that um, those areas, when you drill into them, they won't take a lot of grout. And we had quite a lot of that on Scotswood, actually. 
you find the Newcastle area, there's not that many spoil heaps, particularly from the older mining. Um, whereas if you go down to Yorkshire, the mines down there, they tend to be open and there's massive spoil heaps everywhere. Whereas Newcastle, I've found generally a lot of the voids have been filled with the waste. Thank you very much. I think uh, we're at the stage, if you want, if you want well, you would take questions in the bar, I'm sure, if, uh, if anyone else <laughs> has anything more to say. Uh, well, you've given us an absolutely fascinating subject, and I know, for me, certainly, as I drive down the A1, uh, I, I'm just amazed at how much you're doing down there, and the amount of work that uh, you don't see, you know, that's happening in the background. But uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Can I please hand it over now? to uh, Mr. Norman Jackson for the photo for the thing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what a fantastic turnout here tonight. Obviously, uh, the work that's going on, whether it's disrupting our travel or not, is of great interest. And tonight we've heard a, an excellent uh, rendition of, of the work that's involved, the technical work, and the, the grouting that's necessary to make sure that these structures stand safe forevermore. Um, can I compliment you on keeping the, the job running? Because it is nice to be able to go down the A1 and not have to go around huge diversions. So congratulations on that score. There's one thing I would just like to point out to, to all the audience as a, as, a, as a mining engineer, that what you should never forget in this locality is that you're dealing with multi-seam working, many, many coal seams in horizon. Not only that, beneath those coal seams, which, which can cause instability, there is huge changes in the mine water underground. So nothing is static. Do not assume that pillars are going to stand forevermore. In my view, movement will continue forever. And in my view, it should be monitored. There should be some information available. And this is not being done. So thank you very much for your talk. I would like the, the audience to show their appreciation in the normal manner.